You've played as the Master Chief, the culmination of human evolution, the perfect soldier, and the pinnacle of badass. Tell that to the Covenant. You've played as Thel Vadim, the Arbiter, a stoic, duty-bound elite who once presided over the entire Covenant Armada, a badass to match the Chief. How you doing? And now, in Halo 3 ODST, you'll play as... ME! An Orbital Drop Shock Trooper, otherwise called an ODST. It's an interesting sales pitch to say the least, and perhaps it's something you don't often think about. In a video game, who are you playing as? I mean, first person shooters are all about the shooty shooty. It's easy to forget the role of the player when you get caught up in all the action, and the Halo series traditionally has enjoyed mixing things up, changing perspectives. Master Chief has always been the face of the series, but you don't always play as him. This idea of perspective is important in terms of narrative and also gameplay. When you play as Duke Nukem, you expect to kick some alien ass and hear awesome one-liners. Mm, don't have time to play with myself. When you play Call of Duty, you expect to be a soldier, a cog in the machine who witnesses war on a grand scale. But here comes ODST, and Bungie tried something that would shake up your expectations. This time around, your role in the game is completely different, and the overall importance has been toned down. You're not saving the world and the galaxy again. In a nutshell, you're following orders. So what else do we need to know about Halo 3 ODST? Well, it's not exactly a brand new game. It builds off the original Halo 3 because, duh, and is basically a spin-off. A lot of things will be familiar, and I like to think of ODST as an expansion, like for Diablo 2, Warcraft 3, and Starcraft, that sort of thing. The biggest controversy surrounding this game was its price tag at release. Going for the full $60 at the time for a spin-off wasn't something a lot of gamers were happy with. No doubt a decision made by Microsoft, they maintained that ODST came with enough new content to make it worth 60 bucks. And you could make a pretty good argument against that. This was sort of the tipping point when Microsoft was really trying to get as much cash out of the Halo series as possible. But I will say, Halo 3 on its own was well worth 60 bucks. And if you truly loved the game like I did, these types of add-ons weren't a huge deal for you. But how exactly does ODST fit in along the other games? Is it overshadowed by the more grandiose adventures of John 117? Was Firefight a worthy addition to the franchise? Should it have become a staple? And are the characters setting an atmosphere as powerful as fans make them out to be? Well, let's check our mouths, find our chairs, and get set for a combat drop. When it comes to reviewing a game, I think one of the most underrated and rarely discussed aspects is the marketing. All the stuff we soak up before it launches and we see the game for ourselves. Because unless it's super special awesome, it seems like the only reason we talk about marketing is if it's misleading. <laughs> but ODST wasn't like that. It was like peak marketing. There was style, creativity, and charm in all of it. And I say it's underrated because marketing has nothing to do with how the game plays at the end of the day. And at this point, with Combat Evolved becoming a smash hit, spawning the biggest and most controversial sequel, which led to the ultimate finale, I really felt like there had been a great relationship built up with Bungie and the fans by the time ODST was being shown at E3. And for a lot of game companies, a long-lasting, trust-filled relationship with the consumer is hard to come by. To be frank, the marketing for ODST was awesome. Anytime Joe Staten comes out, it's like, yes, dude, yes. He represents the nerd in all of us. Any fans of the old Halo 1 pistol out there? Yeah? If you like that one, you're gonna love this one. And they had this sick as fuck stage set up. You can see the detail, the coloring, the theme, rain of ODST, and all this promotional material, which is why I chose to highlight it. And I also love how live action trailers have become a staple of Halo's marketing. This one definitely worked in portraying ODST as being a tough and sorrowful experience. It shows us that ODSTs are much more human and relatable than Master Chief is. There's a clear distinction. 
This trailer gave us a better look and understanding of the location of the game. In the Halo universe, it portrays a modern city and its connected conscience of cameras, the network. So you see, all these things they're showing us are reflected and present in the final product. It gets you hyped, it gets you intrigued, it's phenomenal, and it paid off. But then, they came out with the trailer for Firefight, and it blew my undies off. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sergeant Major Johnson, these sound like overwhelming odds. I don't want to drop into hell without an airtight insurance policy. Well, uh -oh. do I have an offer for you? Pre-order your copy of Halo 3 ODST at participating retailers now, and you'll get all the confidence you need. Me! God damn, I wish Sergeant Johnson could have become, like, the spokesman of Halo. Got him selling me this game, asking for pre-orders. If I'm gonna buy a video game, I'm gonna buy it from a badass, alright? Also harkens back to the day when pre-order bonuses were things that very clearly weren't essential cut out parts of the game and resold. Bungie knocked it out of the park when they were promoting and showing off ODST. And it's one of those games where the hype is and was real. It all paid off. Ever since Halo 2, the series has always started with a cutscene labeled as a mission. Part of that is so it makes it easier if you want to jump straight into the gameplay. But as with every story, the opening is of extreme importance to not only hook the player, but also in establishing the tone. ODST opens up with a sort of atmospheric text crawl, which is kind of strange to see in a Halo game. This does a great job of getting us prepared for the mildly post-apocalyptic setting. Plain text is a simple but sometimes great tool to help the audience get immersed. I thought that was a good decision because you're not being told how to feel by some narrator. However, I think it goes on for a bit too long. Basically, ODST takes place in between Halo 2 and 3, and has you defend various locations around New Mombasa. And if you think about it, maybe Bungie intended ODST to fill the gap of dissatisfaction many fans felt with the Halo 2 E3 demo. I mean, there was a lot of people upset about the lack of missions on Earth. And, well, all of ODST's missions are set on Earth. I think it's fitting. So we get introduced to our cast of characters, and let me tell you, Bungie does a great job differentiating them and establishing their character. I've always thought when it comes to character designs, they really nail the aesthetic and have been great at incorporating appearances with personalities. Most of the time, Bungie has been on the side of less is more, so we don't often see long drawn out conversations like you'd see in some JRPGs or Super Paper Mario. Jesus, man, that game is like 60% text. Anyways, despite the short introductions, you're able to get acquainted with and understand the personalities of all the Helljumpers and Veronica. They're led by Edward Buck, aka Gunny, an exemplary soldier who is quick on his feet, large, in charge. He's a little bit cocky, but always cares for his teammates. Buck is more cynical and realistic because he's seen it all, done it all, and been there. Mickey Dutch! Status! Alive or dead, we're pulling them out. You hear me? Make some noise. I got your back. Following him are Dutch, Romeo, Mickey, and the Rookie. I like to think of Dutch as the big guy. He's gruff, loves being in the thick of the fight, and he's a man of faith in desperate times. So, was that a yes or a no? Amen. Romeo is the smart-mouthed marksman who's always got a sense of humor, even when he's fucking dying. We went through hell for that? Give him some meds, would you? It's important. It knows things. Hey, <laughs> Cunny. I wasn't talking about the alien. A reliable dude who pulls it together when he needs to. Next up is Mickey, and he's rather unique amongst most soldiers a pilot and demolitions expert who seems out of place in this war. Cautious and a little naive, Mickey might appear to be a scaredy cat, but underneath, he's got some balls. Hurry up. Look, you wanna do this? Be my guest. But this ain't a job you wanna rush. Then there's the rookie, who basically fills the same role as Master Chief, but speaks even less. In fact, not at all. Some people might have taken issue with the Rookie because we can't really learn anything about who he is or what he stands for, and fans may not like a completely silent protagonist, but ODST isn't just about the Rookie, 
you play as all the other troopers. The rookie's role is more so for players to be immersed in the setting, while the other hell jumpers are there to add character and drama to the story. We talked a lot about how could we still take people out of one character, put them into the body of another character, and not confuse people. And ODST, I think, takes the lessons of Halo 2 and feels a lot more natural. You're going from one ODST to another. It's not so jarring as it was with the Chief and the Arbiter. Allowing the player to step into the shoes of all of these different characters in the squad makes this a game about what happens to that squad. Finally, we have Veronica Dare, the captain and an operative for the Office of Naval Intelligence. She's like a no-nonsense leader, not willing to divulge the true nature of the mission to the rest of the group. She had a previous love interest with Buck, and the two try to maintain professionalism in this time of crisis. We'll get more into the romance later. So after we meet the Kardashians, you get briefed on the mission and get set to come out swinging. This drop pod scene is fucking awesome, and I love how they added the respawn sound effect from multiplayer. We are dropping into hell, troopers! Time to go up here! I also find it funny how the year is like 2552, yet the microphones they're using sound like they're talking through an Xbox 360 mic. I guess it's fitting. This is where Halo 2, Halo 3, and ODST's stories converge. The Covenant Carrier makes a slip space jump, which wrecks the city, we saw that in Halo 2, and sends the pods crashing across New Mombasa. Scattered, weakened, and injured, it's up to the rookie to figure out what happened to his team and complete the mission. And just like every other title in this series, except Halo Reach, ODST starts with a fall from space. I always thought this was a nice little theme amongst the Halo games, kind of like how every Star Wars film pans down after the text crawl. So once you crash down, Bungie does what Bungie do best, and gives you a memorable, scenic opening into the world they've crafted. And my god, I think ODST does it best. You're alone, you're in the city, you're trying to unravel a mystery, that's, that's the feeling you have every time you're the rookie. The darkness, the feeling of isolation, desolation, and quiet. It's a pretty big contrast to the whole, you're a badass in a super suit, go get him, tiger, style that we've been accustomed to. In fact, I'll go on record and say some of the best shooters in games in general are the ones where you aren't some overpowered badass, when the game has reservations and can tone things down. I'd even go so far as to mention Reykjavik's video on saving the world a thousand times later, and reiterate his point that you don't automatically raise the tension and the stakes of a story just by putting the world, galaxy, or universe in jeopardy. And that's what I like about ODST. You're not tasked with saving the world. We've already done that three times at this point. All we're really doing is finding your lost squad of troops and defending Earth. We can feel just as invested in this story as we are when we're saving the galaxy as Master Chief. Not only did Bungie introduce a whole new cast of characters in one game and give them adequate screen time, but it also gave us a more down-to-earth perspective on this universe and this conflict, all without the Master Chief being present at all. So if anything, ODST also proves that not every Halo game needs Master Chief to be interesting. Back to the topic of atmosphere, it's a perfect choice to have Rookie be a silent protagonist, because the setting of a destroyed new Mombasa shrouded in darkness with alien troops all around and not a friendly in sight would be ruined if it was interrupted by dialogue at every turn. It's quiet. Too quiet. But it's also nice how ODST pays homage, intended or not to classic sci-fi movies such as Aliens and Starship Troopers. Hi. We're on express elevator to hell. Going down. We are dropping into hell, Troopers. Time to go up here. One of the biggest additions in ODST is the visor mode, which lights up all the terrain, buildings, and weapons around you. What surprises me about the visor is it wasn't just a gimmick for gameplay. Just like everything else in ODST, it helps to build the atmosphere. When you turn it off, you see how dark the world around you is, and without this critical piece of equipment, you realize how unprepared you would be. When you combine those things that we took away with things that we added, such as the visor, even though you might feel a bit more vulnerable, you have the right tools for the job. Lighting is beautiful in this game, and for certain parts, the visor allows the player to see things differently. To have this ability throughout the entire game, 
gives us an incentive to look around and take in our surroundings. And while for the more brighter levels it doesn't serve much purpose, just the fact that they had to render both of these types of lighting, it's an incredible amount of detail and depth added to the experience. You think about how some games try to rely on the overtop Michael Bay action in order to keep people interested, and here comes a game that is willing to slow things down and let you explore, move at your own pace. When you do what ODST does, you risk boring the audience. But if you succeed, the payoff for those moments of action is much more satisfying. What I'm trying to say is, the game has a brilliant combination of slow, somber, and silent moments mixed in with that great, loud, badass action we love from these games. And it's because of the atmosphere that ODST is able to find a comfortable and unique place amongst the other games in the series. But how does the gameplay fit into all of this? Well, since it's kind of an expansion to Halo 3, naturally it's going to be similar. Real quick though, there's a couple of things I always found strange. Number one, you never use equipment, but the enemies do. You might not have even noticed this, which doesn't make it a huge loss. I don't know why this choice was made. I don't know what benefit it has to the gameplay. I just find it strange that they took this sandbox element away from the player. Two, you can't dual wield. Dual wielding. Paul doesn't like dual wielding, so we cut it. <laughs> this one I more or less understand as ODSTs are smaller and weaker than Spartans, but even so, I freaking love dual wielding. 3. Grenades have a very awkward arc compared to Halo 3, so they feel weird to throw. But other than that, it's just as good as Halo 3's gameplay. ODST introduces two new weapons, the silenced SMG and Magnum, and while it works thematically with a more covert, sneaky sort of feeling, when it comes to gameplay, silencers don't work the way you'd think they would. I don't know, it seems like no matter how stealthy you try to be, anytime you fire these weapons, the enemies notice you right away. Nitpicks and minor flaws aside, ODST, like I said earlier, is similar to those old school expansions in the way that they build upon the gameplay and give you more of what you want, without being an entirely new game or changing things too much. The engineers are a great addition, if not super impactful, but great nonetheless. The structure of the missions are simple. You're a lone wolf who's trying to figure out what happened to your squad. So you search out their last known whereabouts and find clues that lead to flashbacks, which lead to the next mission. This idea of a connected hub world was pretty ambitious for a first person shooter. There's not many games I can think of that have committed to a non-linear level design and can pull it off well. Maybe Bioshock comes to mind? The standard for shooter games is linearity, which is fine, but it makes ODST stand out because you can explore New Mombasa to your leisure. Sneaking through the shadows at night, on the streets, reinforces the loneliness of the city, and it allows the player to submerge themselves in the atmosphere completely. You got all these Covenant squads patrolling, there's not much human presence, it feels like the aftermath of an alien invasion. The technology and effort they put into this area of the game was impressive as balls. In the flashbacks, you'll fight through these areas by day, and as the rookie, you walk through them at night, giving a nice contrast between loud and quiet moments. And it's worth exploring the city because you can find audio logs. Now at this point, audio logs weren't an overused lazy tool for developers to inject slightly more story into their games, and these ones tell a story about the citizens of New Mombasa, it gives us a perspective into the real people on this planet, in this universe, something we hardly ever saw outside of the Marines. With great voice acting, sound effects, and still images, the story in these logs plays out kind of like a graphic novel or an audiobook. It's a strange hybrid, but works very well. New mechanics were added to make the gameplay a bit more strategic, such as the map and nav system which allowed you to see where you're supposed to go, what sort of resistance you might encounter along the way, and where hidden caches of weapons and vehicles might be to help you out. It's pretty cool. I wish more Halo games had some type of mechanic like this. They've also given us the visor. These are tools the Master Chief didn't have the privilege of using. So again, the Helljumpers feel special in their own regards. In any case, one of my favorite aspects of ODST is how it seemed like they drastically toned down the accuracy of Sniper Jackals. Thank fucking God. The return of health packs was a neat choice and once again makes you feel like a soldier instead of a super soldier. Bringing back the health was 
something that was born out of a discussion about how can we add long-term level of tension to the game. For us, health is important in the ODST's world because it reminds you that you're vulnerable. Your new armor shields aren't extremely resistant. You're more vulnerable this time around, which gave Bungie an excuse to make the game pretty difficult on Legendary, but this time around I feel like Heroic is pretty perfect. Not too easy, not too hard. So gunplay is essentially the same, with minor tweaks and new mechanics, but the levels are where ODST really shines. It's a compilation of all the great types of levels we've come to know and love from the Halo games. Yet the quiet, stealthy sections in Mombasa streets, similar to the playstyle of Truth and Reconciliation, there's the wide-open infantry combat in Teare Plaza, then an epic large-scale battle with heavy weapons and vehicles in Uplift Reserve, a tank mission with Kazingo Boulevard, one of my favorite levels in all the Halo games is Oni Alpha Site, for giving us a mission where the main goal is to defend and hold out, rather than aggressively push towards the enemy. NMP DHQ gives us a lot of sniper combat mixed with a rescue mission and a bombastic ending sequence. Kikawani Station is probably the best level in the game, because it has you fighting in these huge tunnels against wraiths, turrets, scarabs, you fight on foot, I mean, it's got everything. Data Hive is the escort mission, making sure the engineer, and later the elephant, stay safe while fighting against everything the Covenant can throw at you. One of the coolest parts is going through the drone nest and having to constantly be alert for those damn buggers. We never really saw what their nests were like or where these drones came from, so that's interesting. These levels, despite their overall length being pretty short compared to the other games, are all totally unique, fun, and memorable. It's like getting one of everything at the buffet. You just feel like every dish is completely new, and most importantly, it tastes phenomenal. Overall, the gameplay in ODST is as fun as it is unique. The scenarios the game throws at you always keep you on your feet, and I'd pop this game in any day. The best addition that ODST brought was of course Firefight. Firefight. Set. Start. Tough luck. On. Some might disagree, but honestly, thank god we had ODST because it allowed Bungie to try new things, and Firefight quickly became a favorite amongst Halo fans. It's the type of thing that I think should be in every game. Welcome to New Mombasa. Ideally, these stepping stones should have led to forgeable Firefight maps in Halo 5 or forgeable AI, but oh well, maybe Halo 6? It's a classic arcade experience in a modern game, perfect for when you wanted to play something besides multiplayer or campaign. It was just another thing for players to mess around with. It's incredibly fun to get three, two, or even one other person to get together, kill aliens, and hold out as long as you can. Shoot for that high score, baby. For bragging rights over your friends who obviously have smaller dicks than you. With limited number of lives, weapons that respawn, difficulty modifiers in the skulls, and the ability to choose which base difficulty you want, it turned Firefight into a full-fledged mode, like it had everything it needed at that point in time. In those moments when you're down to one life on the final round, and your buddy's fighting against all odds, and whether he succeeds or fails, those moments are so intense. Honestly, I think it'd be a really cool idea to not only bring traditional Firefight back, but to offer more unique rewards for completing waves, for getting a high score. Maybe some special armor, maybe a special weapon skin, something, anything. You know, I see a lot of potential with Firefight. It could even be something that adds more story to the games. Think about how Nazi Zombies in the Call of Duty series has transformed over these years into something that's not just fun to play, but it has a story to offer, unique settings that build upon what's there. Firefight should be that type of mode. And even though the levels are ripped straight from the campaign, I think it's a great mode overall. So when it comes to story, one of the themes I got out of ODST was, this time, you aren't invincible. Sure, Master Chief had always gone through some shit, but in the back of your head, you knew he'd come out on top. ODST pulls no punches in showing the Helljumpers being outclassed and getting their ass kicked, which adds to the threat the Covenant pose. It's a very real threat. It's an against the odds, rally together type of story, and ODST alongside Reach go back to the roots of combat evolved in the sense that they don't try to humanize the Covenant, 
elucidate their motivations, aside from the engineers. It seems like Bungie wanted the Covenant to be more alien, foreign, or they just thought focusing on the troops was the best angle to go. I really enjoyed the dynamics between the ODSTs. Have you ever seen one before? Hey, Romeo, you got your ears on? Oh, I get it. Permission to speak, smartass. They banter back and forth, joke around, but take things seriously when they need to. It paints a clear difference between normal soldiers, ODSTs, and Spartans. With this game, we now understand the food chain of the UNSC's infantry and their troops. The Helljumpers feel like real people, and we can connect with them in a way that makes us care. More impressive is the subtext of romance between Dare and Buck. At this point, love wasn't really something the Halo games have really ever touched on. You get a sense that Buck loves Veronica and still has to maintain his professionalism. But at the same time, as the story goes on, he has a harder time restraining himself. I never thought I'd see you again. Yeah? Well, here I am. It's like this huge conflict is bringing out his true feelings and the desperation of their fight means that he and Veronica could get taken down at any moment. At times like these, your true colors show. Must have met a lot of other saps since then. Why pick me for this safari? First, you're the best soldier I know, and second, I don't remember that night. What you asked me in the morning? I remember not getting an answer. Say again, Buck. You're breaking up. I said stay put. I'm on my way. Meanwhile, Veronica tries to focus solely on the mission and leave the past where it is, but constantly relies on Buck when she alone can't get the job done. Yeah, she is kind of a damsel in distress, but it's not because she's weak, but because she tries to do everything on her own. She's still pretty badass. For me, it was about creating a credible history between the two of them. And by dipping into that history, I think that creates the relationship. But as I said, the story is about defending Earth, finding your squad, and completing this secret mission for Oni to capture an engineer and learn about the Covenant plans and motives for coming to Earth which ties into the arc being on Earth and leads into Halo 3. It's not as plot, dialogue, or story heavy as something like Halo 2, but it gets the job done. I'm with it 100% from start to finish. At this point, I feel like I'm repeating myself whenever I have to talk about the music in the Bungie games, because I just end up saying the same thing. It's fucking awesome, the soundtrack is incredible, and it always is with Marty O'Donnell. ODST brings us some of the best musical pieces the series has ever seen, both sad and badass. There's plenty of people who think it has the best soundtrack in the series. And that's what's awesome, is every game up to Reach had a very distinct, unique soundtrack that you could honestly look at each one of them and make an argument for it being the best soundtrack. I can't imagine it's easy to mix these cool as fuck guitar riffs in with dramatic, melancholy songs. Marty is just the type of guy who will impress you in ways you never thought a video game soundtrack could. There's a reason I use Skyline and The Menagerie as background music when I open a new video. So ODST ends with fucking homeboy Johnson coming back from the grave, baby, to smoke a fat cigar and talk with the engineer, leading straight into Halo 3 and filling in the holes. We only captured one. It's very delicate. Don't worry. I know what the aliens like. And it makes his character way more cool because he's treated as more badass than the ODSTs are. He's basically one step below Arbiter and Master Chief levels of badass. ODST's story is short, but sweet. And I really appreciate how Bungie crafted something that is familiar, but feels totally new. Romance, love in desperate times, the focus of audio logs on actual civilians, it's a much more down-to-earth story, and it delivers an experience Halo fans had always wanted and asked for since the Halo 2 announcement. It takes risks, tries new things, and in my opinion, succeeds at everything it tries. What can I say? It was a hell of a night. All in all, Halo 3 ODST is a fantastic game, stifled only by its initial launch price, shorter campaign, and a few strange decisions made by Bungie. But for the hardcore fans and even the casuals, it's a game unlike the rest of the series. It wasn't just an expansion to bank off the wild success of Halo 3. It feels inspired. It's a fresh look at what this conflict has done to Earth and its people. 
something many people felt they were promised and didn't get from Halo 2. So it also makes amends, and added some fun gimmicks to the gameplay, a new enemy to fight, and a new mode to play. Firefight has the potential to be something fantastic, to be on the level of Call of Duty's Nazi Zombies, where it almost feels like an entirely different game. With memorable characters, Buck becoming a fan favorite, a previously unseen perspective, the everlasting greatness of Marty O'Donnell, and a visual aesthetic that enchants the eyes, Halo 3 ODST proves that spin-offs from the main series could not only be successful, but could also become the favorite of many. And that is why Halo 3 ODST was so awesome. So this officially wraps up my thoughts on the main Halo games. Every single one, why they're awesome, or bad, or a combination of both. I really hope you enjoyed this series as much as I enjoyed putting it together. And I look forward to seeing your thoughts on ODST or any of the other Halo games, or even what you're doing today, down in the comments below. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the Act Man for more awesome content. Alright everyone, that's all I got for today. This is the Act Man signing out. Peace!